Uh, thanks so much for the invite. Uh, I am Ying Lan. I run Insignia Venture Partners. Uh, we have roughly 150 million US dollars under management, focusing on early stage tech investments in the region. So uh, my my main link with uh, coding girls is that I have a young coding girl, 10 years old, in the front row, <laughs> who All likes right. to code. Uh, you know, but <laughs> what language are you learning to prepare for the future? <laughs> okay, she my craft. Scratch, scratch, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have today, you know, very uh, the honor of uh, two, you know, moderating a, a panel with uh, you know two. Actually, I don't know where's Bell. I think Bell is probably on the way. You know, two yeah, very distinguished on entrepreneurs, uh, female entrepreneurs who can share with us their journey. Uh, maybe I get uh, you know Shiling and, uh, and yeah. Okay. To introduce yourself. You have a mic there as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Hi, I'm Shiling. Um, I co-founded and I'm the CEO of UILicious. And basically what we do is automate UI testing. Well, a little bit more about myself. Uh, my coding journey sort of started when I was nine. I was uh, on the Neopets website and I just wanted to create a HTML page to describe my Neopet. <laughs> I didn't touch HTML until I was 16. I went to junior college to learn how to code in the worst programming language, in my opinion, back then, C++. <laughs> The horror and uh, but 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 I got addicted. I was like, oh oh gosh, I feel like I'm doing black magic here. Oh, so powerful. Do, wait, do you hack new pads? Is that what it is? Is that what you did? Uh, <laughs> I was trying to make the scroll bar glitter. So, ah. but I, I, I felt uh, but I got addicted and then I started to learn about how amazing technology was. I went to university to pursue information system and I learned how to program SAP, which is stands for slow and painful. So don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Burn. <laughs> This yeah. Off the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're not here anyway, so <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah. So um, after two years of uh, coding in a uh, another startup, I um, I decided I wanted my own adventure, and that's why I started uh, UI Licious itself. Yep. All right, Yiping. Hi everyone. I'm really actually very excited to see so many ladies and also gentlemen <laughs> in such an early morning. Um, well, I actually my my journey is a little bit uh, not so straightforward. I started working since I was eight nine years old with my parents' little tiny food food store, and uh, from then on, I had uh, really multiple jobs from waitressing from McDonald's to sales to really everything and by the time I got to JC um, the only coding closest to coding coding thing is that I built my own website using Dreamweaver and uh, front page at that time uh, it was something that I felt very proud of but it was far away from uh, real coding really but throughout the journey I realized that I'm actually really good in articulating concepts and managing people so I actually stuck on with uh, really trying to manage and being hands-on with uh, developers and uh, designers. Uh, from then on, I uh, fast forward, I took part in, I was from NUS, I took part in an entrepreneurship program from, called NOC. Uh, first few batches of guinea pigs, we went to US um, and I got exposed to uh, tech startups there. And I was working and uh, schooling at the same time and uh, really averaging about four hours of sleep for several, probably a good four or five years of my life. As a student, you can do anything. If you're in your 20s, how many of you are 20s here? You, <laughs> it's great time in your life. Please just <laughs> make sure you don't sleep that much. <laughs> uh, so, so, so then I, was, uh, I started my first company in 2004. Uh, I was about 20 or 21 years old. And uh, my first two startups was uh, uh, probably a disaster. Um, and then my third startup, I managed to sell off to a conglomerate in Indonesia, I exited that, and then I moved to Jakarta for three years, three plus years. Um, and then after my contract ended, I went to work for an AI company in biometrics. I, have, I know nothing about AI, but uh, as usual, I always do things that I don't understand. <laughs> um, so, so now I am on the venture investing side and uh, really very excited to take on this new journey too. Yeah. No, great, great. Uh, so actually, I think some, how, many, how many of you are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs? Okay, only one hand. Oh, we need more hands. Okay, a few more hands. Okay, good. So I, I, I think the, the we ask, let's, let's start with the first question. Why did you start your first company? 
Well, um, for me, I always wanted to work on something that added value. Uh, is uh, added value to people, not companies. So, so the first job that I work with, I'm very picky about where I want to work with. But then, uh, I, 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 the first job that I went to work with, I thought I would be doing some very cool uh, data analysis thing. Uh, I got con apparently. <laughs> I was working on <laughs> advertising technology and I installed ad block. So uh, two years working in a company, I was like, why am I here? <laughs> yeah, so um, I quit uh, my company and uh, I did a little bit of freelancing. And uh, I was actually think thinking about doing a uh, master's actually until um, EF, uh, Accelerator, that I eventually joined. Um, Anne Marie was uh, the one who, who wanted me to come on board. She, she told me, like, hey, why don't you do something interesting? And uh, at that point of time, I think I just wanted uh, some adventure, something new and, and fresh to try out. And um, I just thought, like, if it, if it didn't work out, it's okay. It's just a learning experience. Uh, at that point of time, I'm just 25. So I'm still young. I have the opportunity to go. I, I'm still young enough to, to have very low risk to go and try something new. And if it doesn't work out, I'm quite employable <laughs> with my coding skills. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yiping, maybe talk about audios. Yes, I well actually I have uh, se several reasons. Um, I started off really mostly because I saw how my parents' little store was so successful in the first few years, and then actually eventually had to close down because of so much competition. And when you sell food, it's actually quite hard to differentiate if it's a very similar type of food. So uh, the strange thing happened to me. So when I saw failure, I was actually very stoked and even feel more rebellious to try to be successful. Uh, so it was a way to prove to others that our family can do it. Uh, it was a way to show my parents that um, you know, failure shouldn't be, not that they're discouraged, but failure just shouldn't be the, the thing that continues. Uh, hey, hi, Val. <laughs> So, so we, it's really way, a way to prove uh, ourselves, uh, you know, that we can do it. And then when I first started, uh, my first startup, uh, all the way to Audius Asia, yeah. the one that uh, got exited was, you must know that Audius Asia was the third startup after two failed ones. And I continued doing that because I felt that I have accumulated so many years of actually knowing how to do something better. And it will be a waste to lose, you know, to just throw the uh, white towel and say that and to call it off a day. So I just felt that, you know, if I just keep going, I'm not stupid. I cannot, I cannot say I'm the smartest ever, but I'm not stupid, right? So I have to get it right. And uh, with that, I really just kept going and uh, realized that really it's not rocket science, but it just takes, I mean, it just really takes a lot of uh, time and energy, but um, all this ability to prove someone that you know I, I just can do it and you just need to believe enough that uh, even a field entrepreneur can become successful so there were so many things I was trying to prove and uh, of course doing startups are really fun I mean it's really tiring but it's really fun so that kind of also make the journey very meaningful thanks Yiping uh, hey Val okay now you need to condense two questions in one <laughs> so uh, Val why don't you tell us a little bit about policy pal and you know, introduce a little bit of our background and also why you started Policy Pal. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see all of you here on a Saturday morning. <laughs> and uh, no, sorry that I joined in a little bit later. So um, I'm Val Yap, CEO and founder of Policy Pal, and uh, recently started another company called Pal Network. So Policy Pal is a one stop shop, uh, one stop shop solution for you to manage your entrance policy, buy your policies, file claims, all using a mobile app, and also available on a web platform. Uh, so we started two and a half years ago. Uh, I started it because I just wanted to help you to manage insurance policy. The company has evolved over time. So uh, it came out of my personal pain point because uh, my mom's insurance policy claim was rejected uh, because we didn't manage them properly. Uh, like it was paper format and then uh, we just we just wait for the snail mail to come in and uh, the policy was lapsed once. Uh, when we reincepted the policy, we thought everything was fine. We didn't go for a second medical uh, medical checkup and uh, like make sure 
everything is in check in case there's any claim until the point that um, she, she was diagnosed with cancer, went through two, uh, two surgery, and uh, I was the one helping her to submit for claims. Uh, the, the claim was rejected, it was six figure. Um, yeah, we, we, disp we, we actually went up to FIDRAC. FIDRAC is this uh, um, association that help uh, with any financial issue. Uh, so they, they just rejected it and I'm like, okay, never mind, we'll let the matter rest. As long as everyone is fine in the family, we can move on and uh, earn, the, uh, earn the money back. Uh, but unfortunately, the same year, I lost my dad uh, due to heart attack. Then uh, we had to deal with insurance policy again. He was 59. Uh, we came from um, maybe the normal individual. We do not have any private banker to help us sort out all this. So, of course, naturally, we have to go down to the insurance company one by one, check whether he had any policy there because we moved twice. And, uh, like, that that two incident made me think that, okay, I should probably solve this problem. So, the first idea was just to help people to manage insur insurance policies there. And then over time, uh, as the user base grew, people wanted to buy insurance policy. So we went ahead to apply to enter Singapore regulator fintech sandbox. So we were the first uh, startup to go through the whole experiment and uh, graduated from there. Uh, so started working with uh, insurance companies. So now AXA, Tokyo Marine, uh, uh, MSIG, etc. About sixteen of them. Um, so. After getting our broker license last uh, September, uh, we understand the opportunity and also a huge challenge being a broker is that you are the middle person. Uh, quotation is very dependent on the insurance company and then when you want to help your customer to uh, file the claim, it's very challenging because all you have to do, all you can do as a broker is that you, you try, try, try your best to nudge. Uh, but what can you do with all the data sets that we have and also like what can we do with the technology that like to build out the whole ecosystem. So we've started Pal Network. Uh, it's a blockchain entity where uh, we build out this ecosystem to connect uh, insurance policies uh, and put it on a smart contract to automate the claims payment for the customers. Oh, fantastic. So, so I, I guess all of you went through slightly different journeys to become an entrepreneur. But I, I guess uh, one, one thing that might be useful for the audience is uh, what are some of the myths that you have or the preconceptions that you had before starting a company, and after starting it, what are some of the differences that you, you found? Yeah, why don't you start first? <laughs> yeah. Oh, a huge difference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, my background, I'm Singaporean, and uh, I I done my studies uh, in the UK, so I didn't get to enjoy the NOC program. I have to <laughs> say the NUS NOC program is amazing. Yes. They kickstart all, like, maybe 90 over percent of the startups in Singapore. Yeah, yeah. So I remember I, when I had the idea to just manage insurance policy, but I didn't know how to do it. Like, as in, like, I didn't know who I can approach. I didn't know the network in the, in the space because I didn't have any friends there. So, uh, but of course, I didn't take no for an answer. I went uh, online to research. There was this thing called Founders Institute back then. So I joined Founders Institute. It was a part-time like program for people who are working full-time. So every Thursday, we meet up with uh, 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 similar um, uh, entrepreneurs uh, want to be <laughs> to talk about what we want to do and also uh, on a weekly basis uh, see how we can actually build our company uh, so that at the point of time that was what I know about entrepreneurship I was hanging out with people that like or entrepreneurs want to be with <laughs> with we didn't I didn't get to meet Yiping then <laughs> if I get to meet her I will get to learn a lot uh, about the real entrepreneurship so I think before starting out if you meet the right people you you can have a better understanding back then I I didn't have a chance and then I was like oh I I I I'm just gonna do it. And then I gave myself two years timeline. Uh, so I save up for two years that if let's say I don't have a salary coming in, I still can pay my expenditure. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, give allowance and everything else that Asian uh, children have to do, right? So uh, then until starting the company, everything everything is not just about like paying my expenditure anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a lot more things that you have to think about and, and also when first starting, you were like, okay, uh, being Singaporean is like, oh, how can we start here? Uh, but what I have learned looking back is that we should have uh, think bigger, like what, what are the markets that we can enter, uh, where else can this solution be beneficial uh, 
uh, to the people there. So like those are like quick learnings that I got. Uh, of course, there are a lot more, but I'll leave it to sure, Yiping. Sure. Yiping. Yes. Well, uh, there are myths and there are non-myths. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm just going to talk about the myth. So when I just really wanted to first start my business, I, I also had like that helplessness, right? Where, how? So these are some of my biggest questions, right? And, and then I realized that uh, one of the good head start is really to work in a startup. So when I went to US and started working for startups, I actually saw really firsthand how the founders, most of the time, suffers. <laughs> uh, so in, in a sense, right, there's really no, work, no real work-life balance. There is uh, almost no real financial security. Uh, so I, I saw really just how much effort you have to put in and really from there, I think sort of uh, I, I turned that into a how and a what more towards uh, shaping my own psychology first. Uh, so, so I think that is probably uh, one of the myths like maybe you don't know where to start, you don't know how to start, but there's always a, a, an avenue, right? Coming to places like Coding Girls, uh, there's so many events, there's Tech in Asia, there's Echelon, there's just so many events uh, that one can attend. And I, I think then the, the ones that are not myth is that, but, but it's, a, it's a facade thing, which is that you as a, someone who hasn't started, you would think you would see an entrepreneur upstage like ourselves, and we all look like we make it look easy. <laughs> <laughs> and we might look very like super successful to you, whatever. But truth is not like this, right? So really behind that, there are so many things going on. Uh, there is the, the financial part, like Val alluded to, right? That you really have to take care of. Um, as a student, perfect time in your life, when you start, the only thing you have to deal with is just your parents nagging at you <laughs> while you don't have a proper job. But that's a, I mean, it's a psychological thing, but it's still a smaller issue, right? Compared to when you're currently working, you have a stable job, stable income, you have a mortgage you know, that you have to pay monthly, then those are the real questions, right? Uh, so, so, so those parts, I think, again, with a crowd like this, you just learn through our experiences. Everyone just learn to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I fully agree on that. I mean, uh, one trick that I had was uh, I always go to the startup's office or in Singapore's case, uh, Block 71 on Sunday and see who is there. <laughs> so uh, it turns out that uh, Carousel is always there. So I made an investment in Carousel a few years back. <laughs> I go to Jakarta also. I go to the office on Sunday. I find that hey, only the Gojek guys and Tokopedia guys are there. <laughs> so I made an investment <laughs> in both of them. But that's, uh, I think, to your point on uh, hard work, you know, yeah. and uh, great. The employees or the founders? Both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> and they're there until like 10 p.m. The last bus home. Suri will take the last bus home. Oh. You know, you count, or oh, the last bus is 10, 21 p.m. Yep. But Shiling, why don't you go? Yeah. So I think there's a, one of the myths uh, about starting your own company is that you must know everything uh, in all, and you must be like some 40-year-old man to, to have so much experience to start your own company. But that's not true. Um, I actually had that doubt as well when I, um, when I was asked to be an entrepreneur by EF. Uh, uh, they, uh, Anne Marie was saying, just try out. And I just told her, I, I can only code. That's that's all I know how to do. I I, I know I went to Singapore Management University. The word management is there, but I didn't take the business courses because I didn't like it. I know how to uh, manage engineering teams. Yes, <laughs> yeah. But then um, it turns out. Um, uh, why don't I just give it a try? I can learn on the job, right? I, I just be open to it and just to learn. Um, I think uh, what uh, Yiping says is very important that you need to surround yourself with people who are um, in the community who can teach you. So um, uh, I, I was very lucky. I had very good mentors and some of them are my angel investors as well. So I really count on them a lot to teach me like, hey, um, there's this uh, customer who has this very tricky requirement, like how do I negotiate this? Or sometimes it can even be really hard stuff, like uh, hard stuff, like, okay, I have this employee with a, a, a little bit of um, problem. I, how, do I, how do I tackle it with, with, uh, in, a, in a way that is um, gentle to, to the employee or in a way that is safe or uh, create this kind of safe uh, environment? So I count a lot on the people around me or my seniors to learn uh, what I need to do. So this is one of the myths. Like, you don't have to know everything already to... to um, 
to uh, be an entrepreneur. Um, you can learn from your senior. You can also learn from books. So I spent a lot of time reading when I started becoming, when I uh, became an entrepreneur about how to do, one, one of the good books that I read is uh, called The Hard Stuff About The Hard Stuff, Yeah, which is a really, really good book. Okay, hard things about the hard things, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, that's basically uh, it. Thank you so much for the sharing. Uh, I mean, uh, we as the VC industry probably need to do better to uh, appreciate the hard work by young uh, female founders. And actually, there was a study by H, uh, Harvard Business Review which is that female founders actually outperform male founders. But I wanted to get your view on how has it been the journey as a female founder. Has it been easier, rougher, you know? How has the journey been? Well, if I say if it's rougher, then the, fem the male entrepreneurs will come and attack me and say that, you think my life is easy? <laughs> uh, so I think entrepreneurship is, is definitely challenging, but we have our own, like being a female, we have the challenges as well. Uh, but we have the perks. The perks is that uh, most of the time, so in a, in a startup world, like I think the percentage about 12 to 13% are ladies. and then But in the blockchain world, only 2% ladies. Wow. Yeah, so now after like being in the blockchain industry, <laughs> everywhere I go, they always think that I'm probably like the marketing or the assistant person. <laughs> I'm never like the founder. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the challenge, first of all, is that um, um, of course they will, they will kind of judge you. Yeah, that what, that's what I mentioned. So they, they will judge you before a anything that happened. Uh, I remember when I first started fundraising, I was like, I should have, should, should have visited Block 79. I was, at, I was on Sunday, every Sunday, Block 79. He went to Block 71 only, just FYI. <laughs> but we moved out of the Block 71 and 79. So anyway, when I first started fundraising, the, the, the really tough thing was that being a, being a female founder, I was, I was in my late 20s. Uh, that they, they think this age is when people get married and have kids. Yeah. So I actually had that kind of questions, uh, which initially I thought uh, it, was quite, it was quite inappropriate, but I can understand where they're coming from. Like if they put in this amount of money, they need to ensure that like, the, the founder com continue to be committed for the next round and, and also continue building the business, right? Um, uh, so the, the, the first of all, the challenge of uh, like, convincing people that you can do it, convincing people that you're committed, and also like building the team. Uh, some, some people prefer to work for female bosses, so I heard really good things about Yiping from uh, his, <laughs> his former teammates, uh, Henry, <laughs> from Shopback. Uh, so that's, that's amazing to hear like, like third party giving feedback like this. Uh, the, the challenging part is not many like working for female bosses. So, some of them think that it's actually better because we're, we're a bit more uh, quite uh, empathetic or emotional. We, we, we can connect with them in that aspect. But then something that all female bosses tend to micromanage. Uh, but well, I, I don't really have the time to micromanage, uh, <laughs> just to let them know. <laughs> so those are the challenges. But the, but the perks of being a female founder is that uh, given that there's only 2% of people on the blockchain space, those who eventually found out that, uh, yeah, I'm the founder, they actually can remember you. So being memorable is, is one, one perk, right? So if let's say they're looking for, for investment or looking for uh, companies or like what, find out, finding out what others are doing, that's, that's a key benefit over there. Uh, other than that, uh, being, being a female founder, like we, are, we know how to build the relationship. So like the, the, the perk of like the team member being a bit more loyal, I feel that, and also having a much more diverse team. Like, I'm very proud to say our team is like 40% ladies. Uh, so, we're hiring, by the way, in case <laughs> you're interested. <laughs> Let's go to Shiling first, and then we'll come, we'll come back with Yiping. Yeah. Challenges of, oh no, challenges, unexpected benefits um, of being a female founder. Well, challenges is, um, I, I, I'm a software engineer, right? And uh, I build tools for software engineering teams. So the industry is very, very male-dominated. And there are times when, uh, there are actually times when people don't take me seriously. Uh, it's a bit of a cultural problem in, in Asia sometimes. Uh, some, some parts of Asia, it, it, the, the sexism is a bit stronger. Um, but then, you know, I, I, uh, I, w I will start to switch my language and start uh, going very deep technical. And then they're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and and we also do this thing in UI Licious when uh I told when, when we first started our company, I told Yuji my CTO, I say, hey, 
every employee that we hire, I will be involved, I must be involved in the interviewing process so that, because I'm very aware that there's a sexism involved uh, and it can show up in the interviewing process. Like, I remember when I first interviewed for jobs, there was this guy who say, are you the younger si si sibling or the older sibling? And I said, I'm the younger sister. Say, so you're very spoiled. I was like, well, what kind of interview question is this? <laughs> Yeah, so so it's very yeah. There is sexism, uh, and because I'm very aware of that, that's why I sit into an interview, and I even swap roles with uh, Eugene. So sometimes there's two parts to our interview questions. That is the the uh, general questions like hi, what are you interested in? You are just blah blah blah, and then there is the technical question where you ask the engineer, I, I can you explain to me this solution and walk through the code. So sometimes I swap around, and I'm the one who's doing the code walkthrough, and then the boys will give me the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, la. Sometimes if they don't give me a reaction, I am actually quite okay. I am quite satisfied. <laughs> yeah. So um, there are some advantages. Sometimes um, when I get annoying salespeople trying to sell me stuff, they think that I'm the um, I'm the employee because all my employees are taller guys than me. <laughs> so so they will talk to my uh, employees first, my staff first, and say, are you the boss? And then I just step back. I know this guy is a salesperson. <laughs> and then my employees will just see that I'm doing that. Say, mm, yeah, what, what do you want? <laughs> so I tai chi all these salespeople there if I don't like them. Yeah, that's uh, unexpected by nothing. <laughs> No, that's great. Uh, back, uh, back to Yiping. So you you just became a recent mom. Actually, not recent. A few few months with you. And how many moms are there in the audience? Okay, quite a number. So I want to actually, you know, uh, let you share your view on how does it feel to juggle, you know, parenthood, entrepreneurship. How how do you think this comes together, especially for those uh, moms who are aspiring entrepreneurs as well? So. I would be uh, lying if I tell you that everything is really easy and smooth. Um, actually, I had a little bit of uh, people have postnatal, I prenatal, I mean, <laughs> pregnancy depression. Uh, not not the really kind of depression type of thing, but I'm an entrepreneur, right? When you get pregnant, you start thinking, oh, so how am I now going to manage this, <laughs> right? And uh, I cannot stop to be less ambitious because that is not me. That is not what I want the ba our baby to grow up to think I am, uh, not the suppressed self. Uh, so, so I actually thought uh, long and hard about this, and and um, I've uh, so one of the things that I always do is when I see something that is very challenging, I actually start talking to a lot of people. I talk to people who are potentially role models that I can model after. I talk to regular people in my life, just. Even just talking sometimes to just regular, like even the office ladies in my friends' offices, you know, I just ask them how did they manage, right? And I must say that I got very encouraged. So um, I've seen I've seen models, I've seen uh, models in all walks of lives. So I've come to respect really women in general who have kids. Yeah. So anyone, not just entrepreneur, because I think everyone would uh, really face that kind of reality as long as you, ha you become a mom. Um, so, so I noticed that um, work-life balance is actually pretty tough and it's probably something that you have to first acknowledge. Um, and then really is really coming across just very basic pragmatic stuff like, do you want to trust helpers, which I really trust? Uh, do you want to uh, you know, take care of really the stuff like infant care, things like that? Uh, but really, even in our office uh, quest right now, we are discussing how to really bring in the cribs because mm. our partners uh, who are other males, they also have kids. And <laughs> you know, these days, like England brought yeah, yeah, his yeah. daughter, right? Yeah. So actually, these days, <laughs> if you marry the right guy <laughs> who supports you know yourself, um, actually are very pro to uh, really trying to take responsibility together and also exposing, you know, in both sides, right, of uh, what we do. So just so we were discussing, me and James was just discussing, hey, how about we just buy a crib and then we can bring our babies to come work with us. We could take turns or whatever that is and turn this place into a mini playground or something. So, so of course, we have the luxury to redesign our own office because we, we will have the office, but... Um, for, for those of you out there who are working, 
uh, I mean, there are still ways. I feel like uh, now these days we are really more and more female founders are coming on board, and then we all face this reality. So we are starting to make places more family friendly. Uh, there are more and more co-working spaces that actually also have uh, family family friendly uh, practices. They have one room dedicated to become a nursery. Um, and we, we just need to, I, I think, really just have the community aware that probably it's everyone's uh, responsibility to really create this effort, right? But on a practical basis, now that I thought long and hard about this, and uh, we, I just decided that you know next year I'll come on full time uh, into investing. Um, and and full time investing, it may look slightly easier than building a company. It may look like that, but with investing these days, you have to travel the region. Mm -hmm. uh, it's no longer just really just investing in Singapore. You have, uh, I think you can ask England how many countries <laughs> he travel every so often. Uh, so with that, then really it's just who are your support network. Is it your parents, etc.? And what are some of the schedules that you need to really come up with to be so disciplined and organized that you have time for family, you have time for your well, you don't have time for yourself really. <laughs> time for work, and then put everything together. Like now these days, we also uh, have big outings. Like many entrepreneurs, some investors, we just get everyone together, <laughs> outing together to save time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to be idea. really efficient. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I wanted to make sure there's time for the audience to ask some questions because, you know, you want to get the most out of this uh, you know, esteemed panel. Any questions from the floor? Come, aspiring entrepreneurs, th people thinking of joining tech companies, people thinking of raising money, <laughs> people thinking of doing tech investing. Any questions? Just, yeah. Okay, we have one from the front row. Yeah, please. Yeah. Hello, um, Charlene. Um, we, uh, me and my husband. Yeah, for real. Um, we are we are actually. Um, how do you say? We, we we kind of ran a previous company, but but you know due to quite a few like partners, you know clash of values, right? So so um, th things didn't materialize. So so right now the two of us actually came out and start our own company and. We have always been in more of like, how do you say? We, we are not in the tech space, lah. Yeah, but we want to start a company that that you know the foundation is actually based on tech stuff, uh, like like tech as a foundation. So so that's what we want to do. But right now, one of our issues we are facing, right, is that we feel like you know to to start you know th this company, let's say to do like tech consultancy, for example, you know we we find it a bit hard, you know. Um, so can, maybe you can can you advise like number one you know like uh, how how should we start that okay number two um, let's say if you speak to like VCs right like typically for VCs right do they do they just look at putting money in or do they actually advise us as well so so because we are we are new to this so it's something that we don't quite know yeah so these two questions sure. yeah why do you, why do you start? <laughs> the VC part yes what <laughs> sure well. I think everyone needs to start from somewhere. So even if you you are not a coder, which I am not, you just really have to bite the bullet and uh, number one, learn fast. Number two is that if you don't have the technical expertise, could it be that it makes more sense that you really start looking at some outsource partner and do some projects with them? You know, uh, Probably even the first few projects, you can let the tech companies, uh, say development firms or whatever, Get them, let them get take a bigger cut, tell them up front, and you can, let's say you can bring in the deal, uh, but you're in this journey together. Because these days, uh, truth is that most things were cut across, you have to touch tech. Even the retailer down at the mini store is facing disruption. You have to go online, you have to start learning how to use Shopify or whatever that is, right? So uh, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule there. You just have to take it that if you don't have the technical experience, maybe your first few years is going to be hard. Uh, and you need to really be realistic that the first few years you is really investing a lot into uh, learning experiences. Um, while you learn, so learning is the slightly easier part. There's so many events that you can go to. Um, there's so many tech companies here itself. You can also go to so many of these co-working spaces that uh, let's say in 
even in Indonesia, Singapore, Vietnam, Philippines, they have uh, all these uh, you know, technical coding, well, outsourcing companies out there you can start trying to use. When I first started my, my first, um, uh, for Audios Asia, it's not my first company, but I want to say that because it's truly the first company that I wanted to build a website to aggregate uh, all the Groupon clones, right? And the first thing I did is I went to Odesk at that time, now it's called Upwork. And uh, I started really giving the requirements and getting people to beat, right? Uh, and I cannot believe the cost. It was like 750 US. That was my first website. And then we started making money on our first month. Uh, things are getting harder, so I'm not going to try to make it sound easier. But you just have to start that. And then on the VC question, um, VCs... To be honest, I mean, now that I'm on also on the other side, I just want to let you know that it's not easy to get VC money, number one. <laughs> um, and in VC, you really, they really want to see, or we really want to see traction first. Um, there is the AMP program. If your company is within six months and you're a first-time entrepreneur, one of you could be, uh, you could apply for the AMP grant. Uh, Quest is an accredited mentor, for example. And... And uh, with that, then there is a little bit of expectation that maybe you can you can have a little bit of uh, mentoring going on. Um, but really, VCs is up to help you grow to the next stage. Uh, usually, it's to see a company that has traction and how to grow that rapidly, trying to uh, scale that across the region. So if you're looking for mentorships, uh, probably angels might be a, very, a good starting point. Yeah, uh, so regarding um, technical, uh, building up the tech team and uh, how do you uh, uh, bring technical expertise? I uh, Actually, my point of view differs quite a lot from Yiping herself. So for me, uh, the question really is, is technology, uh, you think about your business, is technology going to be a core center or is it going to be an asset? So if it's going to be an asset, I, don't, I, I really don't recommend outsourcing it. But if you don't know how to code, then you need to you either need to bring in someone who knows how to code so that they can properly manage uh, engineers because I'm an, uh, I was an engineer, I'm also an engineering manager. So I know uh, that as an engineer, you don't want to be managed by someone who doesn't understand how to build uh, technology and uh, what are the challenges of building technology and to ask for uh, building a rocket to the moon, for example, and and not, being, not having realistic expectations. So if... Uh, Find, find someone who can uh, manage the tech team and also otherwise also learn to code a little bit yourself so that you know like uh, know the realistic boundaries of technology yeah well so um, 10 years ago when flash was still uh, flash <laughs> application was still around do you all remember mm -hmm. uh, before Apple killed it, uh, so I learned to code flash and uh, I build websites and everything but um, I, I actually changed my career path and went ahead to financial services. So I was uh, in asset management, banking and insurance, everything else. So I forgot how to code already. But when I first started, I was uh, I was still in banking. So I, I went to Upwork, but I wasn't so fortunate like Yiping. Uh, I was cheated there twice. So basically paid and the code that they gave me wasn't working uh, for one. Then the other one didn't send me the full code. Uh, so I spent, I, I wasted quite a bit of money there. Um, so I, I learned my lesson. Uh, I, I guess mainly because uh, I lost touch with like uh, the latest code and uh, I didn't really understand like what, what I have to ask from them. Uh, so that was the first mistake. So I I learned I learned from there and then I joined a group of my friends. I uh, went to Vietnam to meet up with uh, engineers over there. So uh, really, uh, doing your own research, uh, researching like uh, what are vendors available there. So I went on to arrange meetings and say what are what was the project that we want to build and how much it costs. How do we do the communication? I went to Myanmar as well. Uh, that was before like for, for policy power was formally registered. Uh, but thankfully, I didn't. I didn't engage any of them. 
so managed to find uh, engineer space in Singapore. So how, 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 how I managed to do that was uh, over time as I meet with more engineers, I know about what, what kind of code that they are working on. Uh, and then I, I hear more, I ask more questions about like what they're working on. So you learn a bit more about the current technology because it, change, it changes so fast. Now a lot of uh, engineers are moving to blockchain uh, uh, solidity uh, coding, right? So you have to move with the trend. Uh, so, so at the point of time, uh, I, I, I kind of like follow uh, what uh, Suning uh, agree on is that must treat as an asset. So I really wanted it in house. So like it was very challenging, but uh, I, I, I just came on approaching a lot of engineers and telling them what we're building and convincing them. So managed to find two really young engineers. Uh, so both of them went ahead to, to continue their university. They were, they were those uh, on the break, you know, after national service waiting for university. Um, so they coded the very first MVP. Of course, it's being uh, rewritten and uh, the app that you're using is, is not by them anymore. But that was the first minimum viable product before um, before anything else, so we, we, we launched a minimum viable product, uh, t tested the, the market response, and uh, thankfully we were featured on the street side, which was uh, the probably quite like the turning point that like thousands of people downloaded the app and then uh, we we started having traction and we we started talking to VC because uh, the days of like. Uh, just pitching an idea that I'm going to build this is over. Uh, you have to show traction. You have to show growth and uh, where you're heading to. Wh wh where are your uh, where are your partnerships? Uh, where are your business deals? Before you can talk to them. Uh, so today you are lucky to be able to meet them. If not, like before, I, I actually only met Yiping a year after I started. I met Inland, uh, yeah, maybe like nine months after I started. I didn't have the opportunity to hear from them last time. So uh, back to like the engineering side. So throughout the whole journey, constantly keep learning and, and hearing what the latest update. I remember early this year because of uh, us starting blockchain company, uh, there's this other uh, blockchain company like we're talking about collaboration. So they came down to visit our office. He was very rude to me. Uh, basically, he went and then he, he went into the meeting and say, where are your engineers? Then I said, oh yeah, yeah, they're over there. Oh, you mean you don't code? Like, he, he was so rude. I, I don't really work with uh, founders that don't code. I say, yeah, here's the team of the engineer. I show it to. Th I show show them the engineering team, and then he started asking more questions, and he understand like what I'm talking about. Like I I know a little bit. I I don't code, but at least I know what what he's talking about, and then because of like whatever that we have built over time. Uh, the second time he met with me, and then he talked to my other team members. He actually told my team members that I was very tough on Val because I, uh, I, I don't work with uh, uh, those those. Um, you know, in the blockchain space, quite a lot of people done ICO as a scam. So he was saying that he don't work with scammers. So he was afraid that Val was a scammer. That's why he asked those kind of tough questions. But then, uh, yeah, because I have managed it in a very professional way, he continued like, so So like our business collaboration still <laughs> continue. Uh, so yeah, it looks like we're coming to the end. <laughs> yeah, so I, I get, I'm getting a signals from the team that we're running late. Uh, so I think I just want to wrap up by asking you one word, if you were to, one word of advice to the audience who wants to start a company. What would it be? Or oh, one sentence, okay. One sentence. Oh, one sentence uh. yeah. Technology doesn't solve human problems. Oh, good one. Okay, great. You think? This is totally true. Wow, one word. Oh, one sentence, one sentence. <laughs> well, find the right role models. Uh, Talk to talk to the right people and consider consider your path forward. It's not the easiest, but it's fun. Okay, great. Val. Well. Uh, one word: greed. Greed. That's right. Great one. On that note, please give your hands to get no, put your hands together to thank our esteemed panel for sharing their views and insights. Thank you so much. <laughs>